Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on what to do with your house in divorce. Thank you so much for those of you who are joining us today, taking time out of your schedule to learn more about your options. Um, with your home in the divorce process, we know how complex this decision-making process can be. There's a lot of moving pieces, both financial and emotional, and we wanna make sure that you have the right information as you're making your decision. Um, to get started, I am the head of marketing at divorce.com. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, our um, platform is an all-inclusive platform that helps people go through the entire divorce process. We offer comprehensive services, including expert guidance, easy to use resources, automated paperwork generation, mediation sessions, and filing assistance so that you can finalize everything with the court. Our mission is to make this entire process less stressful on you and your family as you're going through the divorce process. We are joined here today with Angela Deaton, who has a ton of experience on how and what to do with your home, not only um, you know, when you're buying a home in general, but also in the divorce process, because that has some complexities and nuances that you need to be considering. So Angela, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Can you share a little bit uh, more about your background and experience in this um, industry? Yes. So I have been a loan officer for um, just over 20 years. Um, just sad, but true, about 20 years I have been. And so um, the last five to six years, I have specialized in divorce lending. And that doesn't mean I don't do regular client, no, regular, not in a divorce, but I really started, I got a certification, which is called a, it's a CDLP, a certified divorce lending professional. So there's a certain certification training I had to go through to deal with specifically divorce mortgage situations and what to do with the family house and those sort of things. And then um, because of that, I let it led into becoming a CDFA, which is a certified divorce financial analyst, which just takes it a step further into like pension evaluation and net worth statements and division of assets and liabilities and those kind of things. So it's really become more of a divorce specialty than anything else, but um, still do, you know, everything from refinances to home equity loans, mortgages, and all the things. So you're bringing the best of both worlds, understanding all the things related to home ownership and refinancing and mortgages, and then the specifics of going through a divorce, because there's some nuances that people need to understand that maybe if you're not in the divorce process, wouldn't apply. So appreciate yeah. you joining us. Um, before we get started and really get into all the wonderful information you're going to share with everyone here, we want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the first thing we want to um, lay the ground rules on is we have a section at the end for Q&A. We want to make sure that you get your questions answered. So please, if you do have questions either now or as Angela is speaking, drop them in the Q&A section down below in your Zoom um, window, we will be monitoring them throughout. And then as we get towards the end in, in the Q&A section, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so that's the first. And then the second, we wanted to just have a small poll to understand how all of you have been thinking about the home um, process thus far. We know there's a lot of different considerations. And so we just wanted to get a feel for for those of you who are in attendance, how you're thinking about it. So we're gonna put a poll up right now. If you can respond, um, it will just help us as we're going through and identifying you know, where everyone's heads at and how you're um, going through the decision-making process. For a second, <laughs> let everyone logging their answers. Okay. Looks like the majority of you are concerned about the financial impact. Um, so that's definitely helpful to understand. And market conditions is the second um, consideration that you are looking for more information on. That's great to hear. I know, Angela, you will definitely be speaking to both of those. And then for those of you who um, put <clears throat> emotional attachment or stability for your children, we're going to get to that um, and briefly touch on how you should be considering that as well. So Angela, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. So, you know, obviously, like Nicole said, the biggest, one of the biggest pieces of divorce is the family home. 
And it's because number one, it's typically the biggest asset in any divorce situation. And it's also typically the biggest liability because along with the value of a home typically comes a mortgage of some sort. So it's really figuring out there's really several options. Are we going to sell the home and split the profits? Or are we going to, is one person going to keep the home and buy the other one out? Or are we both going to, you know, go and rent or some, so there's so many different ways, but the two I'm going to talk about the most are one selling the house, but even more bigger option or bigger um, alternative is one of the spouses keeping the house, because that's typically what we see, um, unless it's just a, a market where they just want to sell and get out. You know, nobody has the money to buy each other out and that sort of thing. So in selling the house, it's really not complicated. The house goes on the market. You work with a realtor. I generally recommend getting a neutral realtor that no one has a relationship with. So there's no fights down the road about that. Um, getting a neutral appraiser to figure out, you know, what the house is worth, all of that. And if you sell the home, figuring out also, this is a big thing, the tax implications. If you have a lot of equity and there's going to be capital gains, you need to consider who's going to take the exclusion. Is it more than 250? If it is, how is that liability going to be split? So those things are really important to work through because no one wants to sell it. And then after the divorce is final, figure out that you've got a big tax bill that you're going to have to pay on capital gains. So... But, but that being said, selling the home is really the easiest alternative, but in talking about the emotional attachment, stability for kids and things like that, typically comes into play of one spouse wanting to keep the home um, and stay in the same neighborhood and that sort of thing. So if one party wants to keep the home, then it gets a lot more complicated because there are a lot of factors that go into that. If both parties are on the mortgage, someone is going to need to be refinanced off unless it's an assumable loan. So assumable loans are pretty rare. Um, a lot of VA loans are, veteran loans are. Um, some FHA, which is another government loan, but not many conventional loans are, which is generally what most people have. Um, the benefit of an assumption is right now in this market, pretty much everybody I know in my database refinanced three years ago, right after COVID, when rates were in the high twos and low 3% range. So if you're sitting on a mortgage that's 2.875 and you have to refinance it to get your spouse off, you're looking at probably six and a half right now or seven, somewhere in that ballpark, that's a huge increase. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to take over the payment. You have to look at what is this increase going to do. So the benefit of an assumption is you literally keep the same interest rate. You keep the same interest rate, the same loan amount, and they literally will just take one party off of the loan. So if it's an assumable loan, that's a great option. You do have to qualify for it just like you were getting a new mortgage or a refinance. You have to do the income and the assets. And it's not enough to just be like, hey, I've been paying it on time. So that should be okay. You have to go through the whole process just like you're refinancing, except you get to keep the same loan in the end. So, you know, number one thing I would say, if one party wants to keep the home, call your servicer and find out if your loan is assumable. They can tell you really quickly over the phone and then you'll know, do I, am I going down that road or am I not? So that's a big piece. Most likely, like I said, very few, I would say probably 20% of mortgages out there are assumable. So let's say you're in the 80%. So now you're looking at who's going to refinance to get the other person off. One uh, misconception is people say, oh, just do a quit claim deed. A quit claim deed takes someone off of the title and the deed to the home, but not off of the mortgage. So if you don't have an educated attorney who doesn't know that and you write in your decree that so-and-so is going to keep the house and they just have to do a quick claim deed, you're stuck on the mortgage with your ex. And if there's no order in your decree for them to refinance or sell at a certain point, that could be bad down the road if they quit making their payments, they get behind, They let's say they lose their job, they're late on payments, it's going to impact your credit score as well. So it's very important. And that's where I work with a lot of attorneys as much as individual clients 
the attorneys don't want to deal with all of that. <laughs> they basically are like, hey, call Angela because she can understand how this needs to work. Because basically, I know probably everybody on here has heard about getting pre-approved for a loan if you're going to buy a home. So that's really normal. Um, what we are advocating now and what I am telling all of my attorneys is you need to, people need to be pre-approved for a refinance if the decree is going to state that someone is going to refinance the other party off of the loan. And the reason for that is if it's written in the decree, yes, it's court ordered. And if it says this person's going to refinance the other one off in six months, what happens if they can't get approved? So you're four months in, you can't get, they can't get approval. You can't make them get an approval. Like that's not their fault really, as long as they're going through the motions. Um, and so then it's, are we going to go back to court? Does it now have to be sold? Uh, you know, and all of these things. So the way to really get out of that is to upfront during the process of negotiation. And as you're working on the settlement, have the person who wants to keep the home, get an approval from a loan officer a licensed loan officer, not a pre-approval from Quicken or Rocket or something like that, that you can get online. I mean, no hate on them, but you can basically print your own online. You want like a, an actual licensed loan officer to give you an approval letter that you can qualify at the higher interest rate with the higher loan amount. If you need a buyout and all of those, you want that in the file before you put it in the decree, because otherwise it's really hard um, I did a TikTok about this um, and I had over 300,000 views and like 700 and something comments. And I would say probably half of those comments were people stuck in the exact situation I'm talking about, where in their decree, it just said the other person had to refinance. They can't and they're stuck on the mortgage and it's been seven, eight years. What can they do? And that's what they're asking. And so it can be really expensive to go back to court or try and, you know, get it enforced so I would just really, really recommend if anybody is in the situation where either you want to keep it or your spouse wants to keep it, either one of you should get approved for that refinance before the divorce is even become to get, you know, begin uh, final. Um, then buyouts. Let's talk about buyouts because that's a big deal. So generally how it works is, and I'm going to use really round numbers here. Let's say a home is worth 500,000 and there's a $300,000 mortgage on it. So you basically assume, of course, there's going to be some costs subtracted here and there, title policy, whatever, but you're going to assume, hey, we each have $100,000 equity. So you go, okay, I'm going to keep the house. I owe you $100,000. How am I going to give you that $100,000? So again, you're going to refinance, but now your loan amount is going to go up $100,000 and your interest rate is going to go up also. If you were in that COVID boom of two to 3%, you know, mortgage. So again, back to the importance of being pre-approved for that. You can't just assume that someone just because they say, oh, I got this, that they're going to be able to be approved for that, not just the amount they are, have now at the interest rate they have now, but the higher interest rate with a higher loan amount. So um, that's one way to buy out someone. Um, if a loan is assumable, people will call and say, can I just roll in another 100,000 to my assumable loan? No, assumable loans can't even be increased a penny. So if your loan amount is like 301,296, that's going to be your loan amount when you assume it. So you can't roll in closing costs. You cannot roll in an equity buyout. But what you can do is you can assume that loan, keep it in place, and then do a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit in second lien position to pull the cash out if you've got the equity to pay out the other spouse. So that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. I get to keep my first low interest mortgage, but I can still pull from some equity in my house without, you know, increasing my loan amount. Um, so that's one way with assumption that you can do a buyout. Obviously, another way is if you've got 401ks you need to split up or IRAs or stock options, things like that, you can offset the equity buyout with a portion of the 401k. Something like that. So they, we, over here, we have a 200,000 401k. So the other spouse is entitled to 100 of it. This one was entitled to 100 of the home equity. So, hey, how about I'm going to keep my mortgage the same over here 
and I'm going to do, you know, the, I'm going to keep my 401k over here. That way we don't need, you know, a quadro, a qualified domestic relations order to split up the 401k and all those things. And that can be one way to offset it. So that's why buyouts get so tricky because it's like determining the amount that needs to buy out is not hard because you can get an appraisal. You can figure out this minus this is this divided by two. That's easy math. But what, how to get it to the other person and the tax implications of that are totally different. If in that scenario, I was just talking about this one gets 100,000 equity or 100,000 in the 401k, if she needs to be liquid, she has to cash that out, then she's going to be taxed on it. So depending on your tax bracket, now it's not 100,000, it's probably 75,000. If you, you know, if you take out, let's say 25,000 or so for taxes. So all of this to say, this is why it is so important to work with someone who is educated in the divorce piece of this, because there's a lot of great loan officers out there and a lot of very talented attorneys, and they don't understand any of this. They really don't get the piece of tax implications of the split of assets, you know, the how to buy out, can you add to an assumption, um, and those sort of things. So that's why it's important. One um, other thing I'm going to touch on is, so Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who basically rule the mortgage world from a conventional standpoint piece, um, in their guidelines, it says that if you are in a divorce situation and you are going to buy out your spouse and you're not taking any cash for yourself, so literally you are only um, buying out your spouse and that money is going to go straight to them, then it is not a cash out refinance. It is a rate and term refinance. And the reason that matters is because a cash out refinance by definition is about a quarter interest rate higher than a regular refinance rate term. And also the fees are generally more. So if you can avoid having it a cash out loan and have it be a rate term refinance, it's going to save you money, both in the interest rate and in the fees. So I will tell you that I, I work with a ton of attorneys and some of them are literally the best in their field. And they have told me that they did not know this, that they tell their clients to get a cash out refinance to buy the other spouse out. They didn't know this caveat existed. So if you are in that situation where you're not trying to take out money for yourself to maybe pay off debt or do some improvements to the home since you're already, you know, getting money out of it. If you literally only need the money out of the house to go directly to the other spouse to buy them out, then you can do an equity buyout. It's called an ulti lien. It's a weird a W I'll put it in the follow-up email, but it's an ulti lien. Um, and you, it is basically just a lien that's on title. It's a one page document. It's between family members and it says, you know, at closing, this person is paid $100,000. So in the scenario I was talking about earlier, you could do a refinance. You refinance the first lien for exactly what it is. And then the second is the ulti liens in place to pay the other spouse. And the only caveat to that is you can't get one penny of cash back. It, like on the settlement statement at closing, it all goes to the other spouse. So again, working with a professional to know this is key because you really, if, if you don't need the cash for yourself, don't pay the higher interest rate and the higher fees in order to get it. So that, um, the ulti lien and, and that kind of, and again, like I said, some of my top attorneys, like we had no idea. We tell all of our clients just to get equity loans or cash out refinances. So, um, and so it's good to, good to know that those options. So really, I mean, in all these different things to consider, the biggest piece is working with someone who, um, obviously you need your attorney to handle all of the legal aspects of your divorce. But if you are working with a family home in any regard, you want to talk to a professional about that to just make sure of the tax consequences of your decisions and the long-term consequences of your decisions. And, you know, um, when it's refinanced, who gets the escrow refund? There's all these different caveats. But if you talk to someone who knows divorce and lending and finance, then you're going to know up front and you can approach this as a couple coming in. I have like couples who will come to me and say, do this for both of us. Or sometimes it's just one party or the other. But in any case, the information is extremely valuable and can really save a lot of money in the process.
So, and I just talked for a really long time. So this was so <laughs> fascinating. I'm learning a lot and I'm really glad that we're recording this because I feel like it's going to be helpful for people as a resource to come back and rewatch because there's a lot of, um, you know, financial terms that uh, even people in the Q and A section are asking for us to spell that out. So, right. sure and we'll I get will you um, give you know some links. I know Nicole's going to send out kind of a follow up email after this and have some links to you know my information, but also some of the things I talked about, like old healing. If you try and Google that, nobody knows how to spell it. <laughs> It probably won't come up, but I'll give you all of that information and um, obviously my contact information so that, you know, if you have questions, you can, I think Nicole was saying, we're going to extend, I'll let you talk about that. Nicole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of things to cover. The first is, as I mentioned at the top of the call, at divorce.com, we help people um, document these agreements. This is a very common um, situation where people maybe aren't quite sure how they're going to document. So we have partnerships with Angela to help go through the specifics of how you're going to write up the settlement agreement. And then they use our service to do all of that. Um, we even have some customers who are joining as well, who have reached out to Angela once they've used the documentation tool and, you know, we'll write it out. And then we ultimately will file it with the court. We're running a promotion now for anyone who is joining us here today to have a free 15 minute consultation with Angela. Um, if you become a customer of ours so that you get access to her brain to answer <laughs> some of the questions that are specific to your um, case, um, you and your spouse can join or just you so that you um, are really armed with the information and you know how to write up your settlement. So that is the promotion that we're running. Um, I think we're now at a point where we can pivot and do some Q&A. We've had a lot of questions come through. Um, I will try my best to um, get to the ones that I feel like most frequently come up. The first question that we had is around um, the refinancing process and getting the approval. There are some questions around spousal support um, or any other types of income that would be specific to those going through divorce and how they should be considering that when submitting their information to the bank and going through that approval process. Okay. That is such a great question. And I'm glad that came up. So um, this is one thing that keeps people who think that they can be approved as they're writing the decree. They're like, I can totally afford this mortgage. No problem. Let's write it in the decree. And when they find out they can't be, it's typically because of this reason. Um, so alimony and child support can both be used as qualifying income um, as you're qualifying for a loan. If, and here's the two big ifs, one is you have to have received it for at least three months. That's FHA. So that's a government loan. You have to have had three months. If it's a conventional loan, our friends Fannie and Freddie, six months. So you have to have six months receipt. You have to be able to show six months receipt. The other thing that's really important is you have to show three years continuance. So that means if you're, if you have, let's say you have 16 year old twins and you want to use your child support, you can't because likely it's going to end when they're 18, unless you have some different agreement, but most likely it's going to end when they're 18, which means you can't use that income. And I don't care if it's $5,000 a month, you can't use it because it's not going to continue for three years. And that's the same with alimony. So I do tell my clients that I'm working with who are working in the divorce process, if you want to buy a home, if you don't have employment that can qualify you with just the employment and you want to buy a home or refinance the home and keep the home, when you negotiate your alimony, you can't really negotiate your kids' ages, but you can negotiate your alimony that let's say it was going to be, I'm just making this up, 5,000 a month for five years. Maybe you do, or no, um, that's a bad example. Let's say 5,000 a month for two years. Instead of that, maybe you do 2,500 a month for four years because it's the same amount, but it's going to last more than that three years, which is what you need if you want to use it to be able to qualify for a loan. So those are the two biggest things is if you're using anything from, you know, divorce, I mean, uh, alimony or child support, you need the three-year continuance and you need the receipt either three months if it's a government loan, six months if it's um, a conventional loan. Okay, that is super helpful. We have another question here about any kind of trust setup um, and how people should be considering that if that is part of their circumstance. 
Right. So you can do a um, trust if you are going to get a large lump sum from um, your divorce and you want to, and you don't have your own income in terms of, let's say you're, maybe you're not going to have alimony and you don't have kids and whatever. Um, so you're going to put this lump sum into a trust and set up distributions from that trust to yourself. So basically you are the trustee and the beneficiary. So um, the donor's coming from the divorce, but the, you're the trustee or also the beneficiary. The key is, again, the three-year continuance is crucial because if you set it up and you're like, I'm going to take $10,000 a month and then there's only 70000 in there, then it's not going to work because you can't use it. So you just need to be sure whatever amount you think you're going to need that you put enough in that trust that it continue for three can continue from three years from when you're going to close on the loan. Got it. Okay. So those dates are really important to keep in mind. Those dates are really important. But yes, yeah, so a trust is a way, is one way around um, doing that. So is IRA distributions, especially for people in kind of the gray divorce era um, that's really becoming more and more prevalent. I have a lot of um, people who will come to me and say, okay, well, I'm not like I'm retired. I don't have a job anymore and I don't have child support because my kids are grown how can I, am I going to have to get an apartment? Am I going to have to? And so in that, there's lots of different options for older people where you could set up IRA distributions. If you have an IRA, you, that can be your qualifying income. Again, three years continuance, have to have it. You don't mm -hmm. need the six months receipt. You can go off of not even having a receipt yet, but you need the three months continuance. Um, another is like asset depletion. There's different programs. If you've got a lot of assets, but you just don't have a monthly income stream, there's a lot of ways we can work with you. Um, and again, that goes back to working with someone who is, you know, really experienced with divorce situations to know how to, I always call it creative income. It's like finding a way to um, creatively, it's not just a W-2 and a pay stub. We're going to have to get more creative in that situation. Got it. Okay. Another question that's come up in a different, um, a few different ways is whether both parties are on the deed and or a part of the mortgage and how people should be considering that. Is there any um, recommendations or words of advice for people in that situation? Yes. So I would say, um, okay, so if you're both on the mortgage and one person is not keeping the home, my advice is get off the mortgage. If you're not going to be living in the home, get off the mortgage and the title. So you want to disassociate yourself from that house for these reasons. One, like we talked about earlier, let's say the person who's keeping the house loses their job or you know, some, something happens to where they can no longer make the payments. You are uh, just as responsible because you're still on the mortgage. Mortgage companies do not care what a divorce decree says. They don't care that it says that this person was awarded the house. Your social security number is tied to that mortgage. So if she doesn't, and I'm not like dogging on girls or guys, if she or he doesn't make the payment, the other party is going to be just as responsible as if they were the ones in the house not making the payment. So unless you just have this fantastic, fabulous relationship with your soon to be ex where you know they would never ever in a million years default on the loan or be late even a day or something like that, maybe, but I, you know, I'm divorced. I, and my, my ex is amazing. I would not have taken that risk with anyone, not just him, but anyone, because it's your credit. Your credit is your life. <laughs> really? It kind of dictates your life. So don't take that risk. But that being said, if only one person is on the mortgage and they're going to keep the house, so easy. All you have to do is quick claim the other person off. So when we talked about a quick claim earlier, that is just something that removes someone from the title or the deed to the home. So basically they're giving up their ownership. So if the person who's on the mortgage is keeping the house, the other person's moving out and they are not keeping the house, then they're just going to sign away their rights to the house. And obviously that's going to come with are they owed any equity? Is there going to be a buyout? All those things. So usually that that quick claim will come along with the final divorce decree to make sure everybody's been paid what they're supposed to pay. So hopefully that answered the question. But the basic is, if you're on the mortgage, don't get off the title. But if you're 
Or if you're off the mortgage, you can easily get off the title. But I just don't ever recommend to stay on the mortgage. I know some people will say, oh, my kid has two more years of high school and he's going to let me stay there for two years because he's in high school. You know, something like that. If you really trust the situation, go for it. But just in general, I've seen people get scarred so badly by being stuck on a mortgage they can't get off of um, and it ruining their credit. Right. That's super helpful. And there was someone who was specifically asking for the name quick claim deed. Yeah. And quick. What so it's, everybody says it thinks it's quick. <laughs> like if you're quick, it's it's quit, like Q-U-I-T, quit claim deed. And yeah. so it's really just a two-page document any title company can prepare that just removes, it basically is removing yourself. You're giving up the ownership to a property. It doesn't cost anything. I mean, it can cost maybe like $200 for the title company to draft it, but like you're not paying anything to make this happen. You've alternatively figured out what you're owed from the property and all of that through the buyout and the decree. So at this point, you're signing this just to say, I no longer have ownership in this property. So I think that will be helpful. For, yeah, uh, and I'll give one quick example, just because I think that's this is helpful for some people. So like I mentioned, I am divorced. My ex and I did have a great relationship. We sold the family home and we both bought a new home or each of us went and bought our own new home separately. Um, but because our divorce wasn't final, we had to be on each other's title because if you're legally married, the other party has to sign a couple of papers. So in our decree was written that once the divorce was final, we each quit claimed each other off of each other's title. So it was a joint thing. It was like, we knew going in, we're going to be on each other's title till this divorce is final, but then we're going to quit claim each other off. And it was a super simple process as part of the final divorce decree. Perfect. Um, and you've mentioned this a few times and again, a various um, ways of people asking a very similar question about the timing of things and how to be considering that when writing the decree, if they, if putting something two years out or a year out, if there's concerns or things that maybe they're not thinking about that your wisdom and experience will help um, give them some insight into how to approach that. So I would say from a timing thing, what I see most is four to six months. Um, people will typically say, the decree will say, um, this person is being awarded the home. She will refinance this ex-spouse off within four to six months. And you, I mean, it should say one or the other, not, but it shouldn't say either. They, it's going to be refinanced in four months or it's going to be refinanced in six months. Anything longer than that, you run into the risk of, did they lose their job? Did they get hit by a bus? Did they, like, well, all these things can happen. So four to six months gives an, somebody enough time to establish the receipt of income. If they're going to need that to qualify, um, they'll know if you're going to need, if you're going to do a conventional loan and you need the six months, ask for six months in the decree, because then that gives you the time to get those payments in. So anything longer than that, I really don't, don't recommend but um, that's generally what we see is the three to six is four to six months. Got it. And this is kind of in a similar vein of the timing of things. There was a question about a third option, which we didn't really get into, which is continuing to co-own, um, you know, with maybe a potential out some time down the road. Any thoughts on that or experience that you've seen where it's I mean, been successful think, or not? Yeah, I, I I have seen a couple of cases where that was successful. Um, I've just seen a lot of nightmare situations where one person just stops paying or the other person thinks they didn't pay for this repair or this repair was due and they didn't split it in half. It just, unless you are just besties, like it is... Um, you are extending this relationship that you ended um, and co-owning a huge asset together. So you're going to have to agree if something breaks on it, who's fixing it. If, you know, okay, well, the, you know, the fan broke, well, you did it, then you have to fix it. No, it's a joint repair. It it's just opens you up to so many um, debates. So I'm not a huge fan of it, but there are some relations out there, relationships out there where somebody's like, I have no concerns about that. We will be hundred percent fair. And in that case, if it works for your family, I would say go for it. Got it. And then there's another um, sort of follow along question to that, where someone was asking about putting the house in a trust for the children. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Um, I have. 
So you can do, and I would always recommend an irrevocable trust if you're going to do that. Um, but again, work with a trust attorney to have it drawn up exactly right. But you can do it to where instead of a buyout, you both basically give your equity to your kids, you know, in, in a trust type situation. So that is something that I've seen that I've seen happen. Just oh, again, goes back to work with a professional who knows what they're doing about that. Um, a trust attorney. Don't don't let your family law attorney do it. Don't let me do it because I'm not an attorney. Definitely, you would want a trust attorney to draw that up to make sure that it's enforceable, that it's written correctly, tax implications, and all of that. Okay, perfect. Um, this is sort of a, a broad question, but I think it's important to address because there's differences in the way that um, assets and liability are split in community property states versus equitable distribution. All the information that you're sharing today, there's questions or um, uncertainty around, does this apply nationwide or, or how should people be considering their specific state um, guidelines? So, you know, community property states are the only ones that are a little bit stricter than other states, which, you know, there's only nine. And I used to be able to rattle them off. I'd say I know California, Texas, I think Louisiana. Anyway, easy to Google. Um, if you're in a community property state, it's a little stricter in terms of your interest in a property. So um, equitable distribution, which is the majority of the states, obviously, is, you know, hey, we bought the house together. We both lived there the whole time. We made payments out of a joint account. We're going to divide this 50-50. That's equitable. That's easy to calculate. Um, community property, same way, if that's the scenario. Let's say a scenario of someone bought the house two years before they got married and they put the down payment themselves. Then, you know, a spouse moves in, then they live there maybe five more years and now they're getting a divorce. What is that community interest? And that's going to be different in a community property state versus an equitable property state. So again, working with someone who knows this and how to figure out what your community interest would be is key. Some people think, oh, he owned it before we got married. I don't have any interest in this. In even the most strict of states, you still have some sort of interest, most likely, um, because you've lived there. Maybe you did some home improvements. Maybe you're, the home appreciated. I mean, it's different in every state. But again, just working with a professional, I um, what I do is in all 50 states. I can work nationwide. So I kind of have, you know, basically the rules of each, <laughs> each state. And that's why I know. But I would say generally it's equitable distribution, which is 41 of the states. If it is a community property state, you're just stand to for the other person to have more interest. Um, it's really the only difference. Okay, very helpful. I am watching the clock. I want to be mindful of time. We have answered most of the questions. Some of the questions that have come in are very specific to, can you say the word of the loan or the word of the <laughs> um, process, which as we mentioned before, we will be following up after this webinar with the full recording so that you can rewatch and jot down any information that you have. We're also offering, as I mentioned before, the free 15 minute consultation with Angela for any divorce.com customers who have attended. And we're gonna be writing all this up in a follow-up email so that you have not only the recording, but all the resources that Angela described written out so you know exactly how to spell it and you can do further <laughs> research on it. Um, we appreciate everyone who has been participating. There's been a lot of really great questions and we know how complex this whole process is. There's a lot to sort of wrap your arms around. And Angela, thank you so much for helping us uncover a lot of information. Um, I learned a lot in this um, session and I'm sure everyone who's attended also learned a lot. So thank you for your time and thank you for everyone's time who joined um, we would love for you all to stay in touch. So if you're not already on our list or joining on social, please do so. And again, we'll follow up with all the links to follow us and get more information after the fact. But for now, we just want to thank you and say, keep in touch, follow us and be on the lookout for that follow up. Angela, any last words before we drop? Just, yeah, no, exactly what you said. Just follow us and we'll have all the links. And if you have a follow-up question for me, just use that 15 minute free call you get from divorce.com and you can jump on and ask me those questions. Awesome. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. Be on the lookout for a follow-up shortly.